on Bill Moyer's Journal. We've heard what everyone has been saying about Barack Obama's pastor. Now let's hear from him in his own words. The Reverend Jeremiah Wright in his first interview since the controversy. Stay tuned. Funding for Bill Moyer's Journal is provided by the Partridge Foundation, a John and Polly Guth charitable fund. Park Foundation, dedicated to heightening public awareness of critical issues. The Kohlberg Foundation, the Herb Alpert Foundation, Marilyn and Bob Clements and the Clements Foundation, Bernard and Audrey Rappaport and the Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Foundation, the Fetzer Institute, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Orfala Family Foundation, the Public Welfare Foundation, and by our sole corporate sponsor, Mutual of America, providing retirement plan products and services to employers and individuals since 1945. Mutual of America, your retirement company. From our studios in New York, Bill Moyers. Welcome to the Journal. Barack Obama's pastor was in the news again this week. North Carolina Republicans are preparing to run an ad, tying Obama to some controversial sound bites lifted from Reverend Jeremiah Wright's sermons. And CBS and MSNBC led their broadcast with reports about the ad. In North Carolina, the Republicans put their ad on the internet and say they're going to broadcast it as well. Republican hit job, the North Carolina GOP, plans a Willie Horton style TV ad against Obama. Jeremiah Wright will be in Washington Monday for a news conference at the National Press Club, his first since the controversy erupted over those incendiary sound bites. You've heard them. Who hasn't heard them? Wright suggesting the terrorist attacks of 9-11 were payback for American policy. Wright repeating the canard, heard often in black communities, that the U.S. government spread HIV in those communities. Wright seemingly calling on God to damn America. But just who is this man? That's the question I asked when those sound bites began popping up. I'd heard the name Jeremiah Wright. His church in Chicago belongs to the Fellowship of the United Church of Christ. I joined a UCC church on Long Island 40 years ago and attend Riverside Church in New York City, which is affiliated with American Baptist and the UCC. But I couldn't remember ever having met Reverend Wright. So I wanted to know more about the man, the ministry, and the church. In 1972, Jeremiah Wright became pastor of Trinity United Church of Christ in Chicago. He inherited a struggling congregation of just 87 members. I have a friend who every time you greet him, every time you ask him how you doing, answers, just trying to make it, man. Just trying to make it. But by the mid-1980s, when PBS's Frontline shot this film about Wright, he'd grown the congregation to several thousand. In our homes, help us to be your church. In our private lives, help us to be your church. In our dealings one with another, help us to be your church. Though our minds wonder, our souls love only you. Let the church say amen. Say amen again. Trinity Church is located in a largely black neighborhood on the south side of Chicago, a mixture of working class people and the poor. Unfortunately, most churches now are status quo. And so that, you know, to the extent they're not trying to feed the poor and then they're not trying to find hook up jobs and people, they're not concerned about the lowest, the least, the left out. They're not concerned about the youth. They're not concerned about, they're concerned about come, let me come here on a Sunday, hear something that tells me I'm okay and I'm going back to where I've been going, don't rock the boat. How about the fact that we have pledged to take what we've got as black people and put it back into the black community? That's what I want to ask you. He challenged his growing congregation not to lose sight of the needs of their neighbors. I want to be a vehicle designer. That meant soup kitchens, daycare, drug and legal counseling, and mentoring for young people. I watched TV and looked at lawyers the past years and I basically like, you know, the field of being a lawyer. It's like, it's really exciting. As a matter of fact, there's, there are a couple lawyers here in the church that maybe we can just hook you up with. Well, I like to be a doctor. 
You can't be what you ain't seen. And so many of our young boys haven't seen nothing but the gangs and the pimps and the brothers on the corner. They've never sat and talked to lawyers. They've never sat and talked to a, to a man, a black man with two, three degrees. Um, they never had a chance. They never had an option in terms of thinking, I can do this, I can be this. Uh, they see a doctor when they're sick. They don't, they don't get to sit and talk, I, me, go to med school. They don't talk to somebody who writes programs and analyzes systems and computers. A black guy, I, I can do this. I can never have their horizons lifted. Commitment to the black community. Three. Commitment to the black family. Four. He spoke out about racism, from segregation in America's cities to the apartheid regime of South Africa. What the word says about racism comes through loud and clear. Both are is wrong. South Africa is wrong. Apartheid is wrong. Oppression is wrong. Anybody who feels white skin is superior to black skin is wrong. Around that time, a young Barack Obama came to Chicago and went to work as a community organizer on the South Side. As he describes in his book, Obama was a religious skeptic at first and sought out Pastor Wright for his knowledge of the neighborhood. But soon, Obama began attending Sunday services and in 1988 was baptized there as a Christian. Twenty years later, Trinity has built a new building for its burgeoning congregation, now over 6,000 members. Its ministry has grown as well. How much is six from, from eight? Including tutoring for kids, you know, you may have women's health may programs, and an HIV AIDS ministry. <laughs> Trinity has long had strong ties with the African roots of its faith. Parishioners are asked to respect what they call the black value system, to rededicate themselves to God, the black family, and the black community, reinforcing the motto that they are, quote, unashamedly black and unapologetically Christian. You see the connection to Africa and the stained glass windows right installed in the new church. They depict many of the biblical stories that took place there. We wanted our stained glass windows to tell the story of the centrality of Africans in the role of Christianity from its inception up until the present day. We play some interesting games educationally with the kids to help kids understand, um, can you name the seven continents? He's a kid, you learn that in, in school. All right, on what continent did everything in the Bible from Genesis to Malachi take place? And they'll give you an eighth continent, the Middle East. No, 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 you just named seven continents. What continent do these things take place on in your Bible? It's that kind of biblical truth put in stained glass so kids can understand this is not something somebody made up. This is not something from black power. Ooh. This is actual biblical historical fact that you have a central role in the Christian faith that is yours. Our focus today is on 127. Several years ago, Jeremiah Wright and the church began the search for his successor. And after 36 years as pastor, he will be retiring at the end of next month. But in Genesis 2, it says God breathed into the nostrils of what God had formed from the dust. God donated some divinity to some dirt, and we became living souls. That, that, that's God's breath you, you have in you. That, that's God's breath that you just breathe. God is the giver of life. Let me tell you what that means. That means we have no right to take a life, whether as a gangbanger in the thug life or as a president lying about leading a nation into war. Whether through the immorality of a slave trade or the immorality of refusing HIV AIDS money to countries or agencies that do not tow your political line. We have no right to take a life. Turn your name and say, we have no right to take a life. That was Reverend Jeremiah Wright three years ago. He's with me now in the studio. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Let's start with first things. When did you hear the call to ministry. How did it come? I was a teenager uh, when I heard the call to ministry. I grew up in a parsonage. I grew up a son and grandson of a, a minister, which also gave me the advantage of knowing that there were more things to ministry than pastoring. And I had no idea that I'd be preaching or pastoring a church at that teenage year. As a matter of fact, I left, I left um, Philadelphia going to, to Virginia Union University. And unfortunately, I was started during the Civil Rights Movement. 
And the civil rights movement showed me a side of Christianity that I had not seen in Philadelphia. I had not seen Christians who, as I saw in Richmond, Virginia, who loved the Lord, who professed faith in Jesus Christ, and who believed in segregation, saw nothing wrong with lynching, saw nothing wrong with Negroes staying in their places. I knew about hatred, I knew about prejudice, uh, but I didn't know Christians participated <laughs> in, in, that, in that kind of thinking. So what did that do to you? It made me question my call. It made me question whether or not I was doing the right thing. It made me pause in my educational pursuit. Uh, pursuit. I stopped school in my last year at 